This is Miss Beverly Coburn, and today she's going to be talking to us about her experiences at Kambala during the Second World War. So I'm just going to start off by asking where and when were you born? I was born in Dremoyne, in Sydney, at a, a little hospital called Seacombe. Um, what years did you attend Kambala? I was at Kambala from 1939 to 1951. And of course, if you, those that have been listening carefully this morning, the Second World War broke out in 1939. So that's when both the war and I uh, started at Kambala. Um, what house did you belong to? I belonged to Wentworth. <laughs> hey! Uh, um, how old were you during World War II? I was six when it started and 12 when it finished. So I suppose those years of um, not really taking the war seriously at first and then becoming more aware a bit later on as it started to impact really uh, on this part of the world, this harbour, this area, because of its value to the Japanese. So what was it like growing up during World War II and how did your life at home change because of it? Well, First of all, I must admit that, uh, and I have to admit that it was really a bit frivolous. Uh, what's a war? And it was so far away, Europe. I suppose we didn't even understand what war really meant. But we did have to make some precautions and um, we had to take, uh, be aware that every light that shone uh, out of a house was a target if we ever had a, a plane fly over. And so we had to black out all the windows in our house where there was a rubber paint, uh, paint on available. And you painted it on all the windows, um, very ugly. Uh, and we were told that if there were air raid, uh, the air raid siren went off, we had to fill the bath with water in case the water was cut off and then go to the nearest uh, air raid shelter. Now, we had a house next door with a garage that went under the house and they had a sandbag wall in front of it so we used to go down there and they had these air raid practices and so down we'd go and we'd be there playing really because there was no danger as far as we knew. Um, my mother used to sell what they called war saving stamps which was sixpence which was about five cents uh, up and down the street, and that all went to the war effort because sixpence was a little bit more valuable than even five cents these days, and it added up, and that went to the Red Cross. Uh, and then people were chosen in the area as wardens, and they were allowed to wander the streets checking to see if they could see any lights. And then they'd knock on the door and say, your a light is showing. Uh, and they were also there to make sure that there were um, everybody was in inside when it was got uh, when it got dark um, apparently we did have two or three air raids while I, uh, during the war and I'll talk about that a bit later uh, but basically no pressure no worries just I didn't even know what was going on. I think my mother read the newspaper every day because my father was away in the Navy uh, and it was just me at home. Um, but I don't think I cared. It was very <laughs> sad, really. <laughs> so what was Kambala like during World War II? So like the things that you touched on before, like air raid drills, blackouts and other precautions? Well, uh, Kambala took the air raid very serious, the uh, war very seriously because we were in a very precarious position, not far from the Rose Bay flying boat area where they had um, manned f uh, planes ready for war and also uh, near the harbour, near the bridge, really, if you're up there. 
So um, Tivoli was reinforced down <coughs> below with beams and uh, bags. I think we have a picture of that. Actually, there it is. In the middle there, you can see the bricks in front of the main entrance, uh, so that if there was a direct hit, uh, people on either side would be protected from at least the uh, bricks and the masonry flying. Then every girl in the school was asked to create a bag which was filled with kapok or soft material and it had pockets and in the pockets were cotton wool to be put in your ears in case of um, a bomb exploding which would cause your ears to burst. Um, a peg, in the, the peg, back to the peg. <laughs> that was supposed to be put in your mouth and round your ears and you'd had to bite on it in case a bomb exploded. Well now, when I had my bag, it, it, I didn't have one of those. It was a rubber <coughs> door stopper and I used to supposedly put that in my mouth. And as, as well as in the bag was barley sugar for sucking to keep your ears and mouth sort of from clogging up and something to do, read or sew or something like that. And we had air raid drills at school where we'd go into the air raid area in Tivoli and we'd take our bags with us and we'd be there until the, um, the bell rang to say that it was an all clear. Uh, I don't think there was ever an air raid drill, or at least undrill, uh, a proper air raid problem during school hours, but there were two or three during the night when the boarders were all ushered into the air raid shelter <coughs> once for about five hours because I, they never found out why the, the, RA, the air raid siren went off and it, they just sat there. Sorry. They just sat there and um, uh, waited till the all clear, which eventually happened. Um, and we used to have special drills just for exercise. Um, Kambala girls, older ones I think, knitted and created things to send overseas through the Red Cross. Uh, that we had um, cake days and um, fates to make money to help with the war effort. Um, basically the main uh, problem was when the ja Japanese bo bombed Bel <coughs> Pearl Harbor because up till then Australia was so far away from the war it didn't matter. But when the Japanese came into the war that was uh, another story and of course you all know we were bombed in Darwin and other areas and of course the Sydney Harbour a mini subs that managed to get in through the boom, which was a big um, uh, wa uh, netting right across the harbour. I heard you heard about that. Um, the boom was lifted so that a ferry could get through, and while that was happening, three little mini subs got through and did some very bad damage. Uh, they um, managed to hit one of their torpedoes with a, a little. A, a living quarters called the Cuttable with some American soldiers on it, or sailors, and they were killed. Uh, and the other two subs fortunately didn't do any damage, but they were later found, and I think there's one on the exhibition somewhere, made out of the parts of two of them. Um, and also, we were bombed, You, were, this area was bombed from the ocean the next week, from the mother sub, the one that had had the baby subs in it. So we were then really seriously aware of the war. And again, I suppose between the ages of eight and uh, that I was, it still didn't impact on me. There was no fear. It was just over there or next door. Have any of you read um, Tomorrow When the War Began? No? Well, it's quite a good series of books uh, about the Japanese actually coming, or not the Japanese, but a foreign agent coming down into Australia and five young kids coping with it. It's quite interesting if you're looking for something to read. 
It's in a series of about five books. But the first one is Tomorrow When the Year the War Began by John Marsden. Right. I pretty much touched on everything. Oh, did I? This, this is my last one. Uh, um, what did a Kambala education do for you? Ah, uh, what did my Kambala education do for me? Well, first of all, um, the fun, fantastic friendships I made by starting in at five years and staying at the one school until I was nearly 18, in fact, I was 18, was a blessing. I have friends now still that I can say I've known you for 84 years, and um, there are several still with us. Uh, the kindergarten union uh, was very selective in taking uh, people as their um, students, and the word Kambala was the door that opened for me. I just had to say I was a Kambala girl, and I was there. So I studied for three years at the Kindergarten Union and, beca and became a preschool teacher, kindergarten to year two. Uh, then I worked, uh, oh, then I sort of intervened with a, a marriage and a family. And then eight years later, I went back to uh, work and um, I worked with the department for five years uh, and taught at places like Carlingford, Castle Hill and Kenthurst. Uh, and then I noticed a job at Meriden, which is pretty well a sister school to you because it's very similar in its ethos and its success at the moment. So I... Um, I applied and got a job there. So I was mistress in charge of the junior school at Meriden for 23 years. Again, because I was a Kambala girl and I, was, um, I had been confirmed, I, was all the right, I had all the right needs to continue with a career. And that's what Kambala did for me. Plus, I never wanted to stop learning. I did courses. I did an ESL course. Um, I went and got my degree in uh, a Bachelor of Ed. And even now, I'm doing a little bit of uh, work with a, um, a program called U3A, University of the Third Age, where people in their 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s want to keep their brains going. So they go to classes. And if somebody in the class has an expertise in something, they take the class and uh, they continue to teach. So that's where I am at the moment. What happened was during um, some Christmas, I got a card with a picture of Kambala on it. It was written, uh, painted by Cedric Emanuel. And I thought, that's lovely, I'll have that painted. And a friend of mine painted it and it was beautiful, but what would I do with it? So I decided to present it to the school and from there, I got an invitation back here to tell the school about my uh, life and now to tell you about my war years. So that's it. Thank you very much. school in Braxton and uh, several of the girls left for the war period and went up there then returned after the war but by the same token when the Japanese bombed up in Singapore or entered Singapore a lot of commercial people who worked in the banks and things up there left in a hurry came down to Sydney and about six or eight of them had children girls who came to Kambala. So we had this group of um, girls that came during those really um, years where you made friends and kept them. And uh, for that period, until about, uh, the 40, about 45 or 46, when they all went back to whatever they were doing, some went back to England and some went to, back to Singapore, uh, we made these friends. So, and there's some of them were boarders, uh, and uh, Miss Hawthorne, the headmistress there, became their kind of mother for the time being because their parents were 
elsewhere. Some were even uh, in prison of war camps, you know, it was that serious. Uh, so uh, they were safe here and, and I remained friend with one of them who lived in Surrey in England for almost until a couple of years ago when I believe that she was unwell and not able to communicate anymore. But um, that was a, just a little exercise. And then the girls that were in Brankston came back and continued. I rang a couple of my friends and two of them had uh, not been around. And one of them remembered a few of the things that I remembered about my school days, which luckily they didn't show on that video. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. We would like to say a very big thank you on behalf of all of the girls for coming in today and sharing your insight with us. Oh it's been such a privilege to hear from such an important environment. Thank you. Oh, they're gorgeous. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely gorgeous. Thank you so much.